Coming to you from deep inside the bowels of a great big empty. Get ready for another episode of The Home Defense Show with Skip Coriel. Hello, American families. Welcome to this week's episode of The Home Defense Show. I'm your host, Skip Coriel. And if you love your family, care about them deeply, and want to learn how to protect them in every facet of your life, and you've come to the right place. Oh man, we got a really good show. We are going way up, way, way, way up in Michigan to the Upper Peninsula. Some people say that's a whole nother state up there. Actually, I used to teach up there and some of the people would say, well, it's a whole nother country. Uh, they would call it the Superior State. But hey, we're going to be speaking with Bob Peterson, one of the founding members of Delta County Gun Owners. And we're going to be talking about all kinds of stuff. We'll be talking about the Upper Peninsula, Upper Peninsula people. We'll be talking about Delta County Gun Owners, what they do, uh, what they're all about, and boy, about freedom. We're going to be talking a lot about freedom uh, with a youper. Um, so... Stay tuned for that. Going to have a really good time with Bob Peterson from Delta County Gun Owners. All right, now, what have I been doing? I have been working my little uh, Watusi off uh, the past week, uh, two, three weeks. I have been uh, working on my next novel, book number 13. I'm hoping that's a lucky number. But the uh, title of this book, the working title, is Jack Pine. And oddly enough, it's all about a fictional township up in the Upper Peninsula, uh, the Keweenaw, if you know where the Keweenaw is. Uh, I love it up there. I used to go up to Lantz, uh, Barriga area up there, and I would teach concealed carry classes up there for a friend of mine. I would go up there three, sometimes four times a year. We'd even teach a couple of, of advanced classes up there. Had a really, really good time. There's just something about the air in the Upper Peninsula. It's like the closer you get to Lake Superior, the better you feel. I don't do that anymore. I would love to go up there and teach some concealed carry classes. So if you have any connections up there, Anyone who needs concealed carry classes done, I am your man. You give me a call, uh, 269-838-5586, or email me at skipcoriel at hotmail.com. I miss my time up in the Upper Peninsula, so I'd love to go up there again and again and again and again. Anyways, back to this novel. Remember how I told you it's a romance? Well, it's not a romance. I know this because my wife told me so. And she would know, right? I mean, I, you know, I, I thought I, I could do it, but you know, I got to page fifty-seven. I, you know, I killed the first person off, and you know, it wasn't a big deal to me. But then I, I'm up to like page hundred and twenty right now. I've killed four people, and I'm getting ready for another round, uh, a killing here. You know, as a writer, I just get that killing itch. Uh, you know, I don't know if you can understand that, but. That's just the way it is for me. And so it's definitely not a romance. Um, I might even kill off the girl. I don't know. We'll just have to wait and see how it goes. You know, these things with writing novels, you just take it a little bit at a time, right? One step at a time. But that's what I'm going to be doing. I'm still teaching classes, as always. It's cold out there, but it's enjoyable. You just have to work a little bit harder to stay warm. You know, at least I'm not in the Upper Peninsula where it's really, really cold. I think they think all us trolls. That's what they call us. Uh, youpers call everyone who lives under the bridge a troll. And that just sounds so appropriate to me anyways. But you got to be a special breed of tough to live in the Upper Peninsula. Just my opinion. Last night. I had a really good time. I talked for two and a half hours with a, a new church that I'm going to be working with, uh, a, a church uh, safety team. Uh, six guys, we just sat around, you know, shot the bull. Well, we didn't shoot the bull. We were inside a church. We talked for two and a half hours about all things 
you know, church safety. We talked about mass shooter events. We talked about tactics. We talked about tactical precision, different kinds of guns, holsters, you name it. We just got to know each other. And I am really, really looking forward uh, to working with these guys. I can't tell you the name of the church because that's confidential, but I tell you, it's going to be a really, really good time. If you are a member of a church and you don't have a safety team yet, boy, you need to work that out. Because churches, as are schools and other pistol-free zones, you are a soft target. And if you don't have uh, contingencies in place, if you're not protected, it's Katie bar the door. When that bad guy comes uh, uh, walking on into the auditorium and you got no one to stop him, you'll wish that you had formed a safety team beforehand. But don't wait for that to happen. Check it out. All right, let's go into the news. Lots and lots happening. First, let's go to foxnews.com. Speaking of freedom, Venezuelans regret gun ban, a declaration of war against an unarmed population. This is written by Holly McKay, Fox News. There's a picture there of uh, Hugo Chavez, the dictator-in-chief. All right, this is from Cucuta, Venezuela, Colombia border. As Venezuela continues to crumble under the socialist dictator of President Nicolas Maduro, some are expressing words of warning and resentment against a six-year-old gun control bill that strips citizens of their weapons. Guns would have served as a vital pillar to remaining a free people, or at least able to put up a fight, Javier Venegas, 28, a Venezuelan teacher of English now exiled in Ecuador, told Fox News. He was exiled to Ecuador. Wow. Well, at least he's not going to get cold there. How are the winters there, Javier? The government security forces at the beginning of this debacle knew they had no real opposition to their force. Once things were this bad, it was a clear declaration of war against an unarmed population, said Javier. And he's right. Boy, you know, you you give up your guns to the government, and you're just inviting the worst part of humanity. You really, really are. You can just, in the Marine Corps, we'd just say, you could just stand the F by. Well, we'd fill in the blank. Under the direction of then-President Hugo Chavez, the Venezuelan National Assembly in 2012 enacted the Control of Arms, Munitions, and Disarmament Law. You know, a.k.a. we're coming for your guns. If you try and keep them, we'll kill you. That law. With the explicit aim to disarm all citizens. The law took effect in 2013 with only minimal pushback from some pro-democracy opposition figures banned the legal commercial sale of guns and munitions to all except government entities. Well, that's rather Hitler-esque, isn't it? Chavez initially ran a months-long amnesty program encouraging Venezuelans to trade their arms for electrical goods. What does that even mean? What, like a big screen television or something? Here, you can either have your freedom or a big screen TV or this boombox. Go ahead. What price freedom? Oh, my gosh, folks. That year, there were only 37 recorded voluntary gun surrenders, while the majority of seizures, more than 12,500, were by force. So they didn't push back from this, but they didn't voluntarily give up their guns either. In 2014, with Nicolas Maduro at the helm following Chavez's death, but carrying through his socialist Chavista policies, The government invested more than $47 million enforcing the gun ban. They don't have any money. They can't even feed their people in Venezuela. And they spent $47 million to disarm them. Wow. This has since included grandiose displays of public weapons demolitions in the town square. Oh, all to keep the people safe, right? A former gun store owner inside Venezuela who told Fox News he has now been relegated to only selling fishing supplies since the ban. He said he can't sell any type of weaponry, even a slingshot, and underscored that even BB ammunition and airsoft guns are only issued to police and military officers. The punishment for illicit carrying or selling a weapon is now 20 years behind bars. You know, that's kind of in the news... uh, This past week, isn't it? 
you know, here in America, we sometimes we get smug and we go, wow, hey, look at our gun rights. But didn't our commander in chief just outlaw bump stocks? Bump stocks. They, they, they were used in one shooting and now they're illegal. Folks, the price of freedom is eternal vigilance. Don't ever, ever forget that. Prior to the 2012 reform, there were only eight gun stores in the entire country, and the process of obtaining a legal permit to own and carry was plagued by long wait lines, high cost, and bribery to make the process swifter at the one department that was allowed to issue licenses, which operated under the umbrella of the Ministry of Defense. Well, here in America, we call that the ATF. Venezuelans didn't care enough about it. The idea of having the means to protect your home was seen as only needed out in the fields. People never would have believed they needed to defend themselves against the government, Venegas explained. Venezuelans evolved to always hope that our government would be non-tyrannical, non-violator of human rights, and would always have a good enough control of criminality. Well, guess again. Venezuela. Jeez. You know, it's just the same story over and over and over again. This is not new. This has been going on since the dawn of time, folks. There's always one segment of society that wants to dominate everyone else. And if you don't have the weapons to resist, it's only a matter of time. Folks, do not take your gun rights lightly and certainly don't ever think it could never happen to us it could never happen to america because you start thinking like that then you you stop actively fighting to upgrade your rights if you're not going forward you're going backwards folks get serious what else we got here uh let's lighten up a little bit here this is from uh, again from fox news Hunter thought he was firing at Bigfoot, victim tells police. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, that's funny because in the next segment, uh, we're going to have Bob Peterson from the Upper Peninsula. And uh, I wonder how many Bigfoots, would that be Bigfoots or Big Feet, do they have in the Upper Peninsula? How many of them are up there? How many sightings a year do they get? You know, aliens, Bigfoot, Sasquatch, you know, all of them. A Montana man who was out target shooting became a target himself when another shooter unloaded a barrage of gunfire on him after mistaking him for Bigfoot, authorities said. This guy must be incredibly ugly. Hairy, big, hairy, and ugly. The 27-year-old shooter told authorities that he was putting up targets outside Helena on Sunday when bullets started flying toward him. Lewis and Clark County Sheriff Leo Dutton said, according to the Idaho Statesman, one round came within three feet of the victim and another whizzed by even closer, he told the police. The man said he ran behind nearby trees for cover and eventually confronted the shooter. <laughs> I don't think I'd be confronting the shooter. I think I'd be getting the heck out of Dodge, who was driving a Ford F-150 pickup truck. Apparently that's important for some reason. Quote, I thought you were Bigfoot, the victim says the shooter told him, according to Dutton. I don't target practice, but if I see something that looks like Bigfoot, I just shoot at it. Now, how can you argue with that logic? You know, if I saw Bigfoot, you know, I'd, I'd shoot Bigfoot. I mean, I, I really, really would. Uh, if I saw Bigfoot, I mean, you're talking, he's what, what, 10 feet tall, big and hairy, and doesn't talk much, the, the tall, uh, silent type. Um, I think I'd just shoot him. Uh, I, I just wouldn't take chances. I mean, maybe he's a nice guy, but how do you know? And, you know, it's, it's like a, one of those big Wookiees uh, from uh, Star Wars, right? He could just rip you in half. So if I see Bigfoot, I'm going to shoot now, ask questions later. Once the man assured the gunman that he wasn't Bigfoot, an ape-like creature said to inhabit wooded areas in the Northwest, the shooter advised him to wear an orange vest in the future. <laughs> so all you Bigfoots out there listening, just wear an orange vest. You'll be fine. But Dutton noted that there was some question about the veracity of the report because the victim who spoke to police a day after the alleged incident couldn't provide a physical description of the shooter. Well, he was probably scared to death. Police checked the area but didn't find the pickup truck. Who knows? 
All right, be careful of Bigfoot, all the Bigfoots. We'll have to ask uh, Bob Peterson from Delta County Gun Owners exactly how many big feet they have up there uh, in the Upper Peninsula, because you know they got to have some of them. All right, well, folks, that is about all the time we have for this segment. When we come back in segment two, we're going to have Bob Peterson, one of the founding members of Delta County Gun Owners, in the Upper Peninsula. Right now, we got a two-minute break. While we're away, go ahead and check out firearmslegal.com slash Tactical and see what they can do to help you protect yourself should you ever have to use your firearm for self-defense. And then go to elitefirearms.us and see what Larry Jackson can do to help you choose the right firearm for your family. When we come back again, Bob Peterson, founding member of Delta County Gun Owners. This is Skip Coriel on the Home Defense Show. Don't go anywhere. We will be right back. My name is C.J. Coriel. Welcome to the Home Defense Show with my dad, Skip Coriel. Don't go nowhere. We'll be right back. This is Skip Coriel from the Home Defense Show, and I want you to have the very best handgun that money can buy. And that's why we recommend you visit Larry Jackson at Elite Firearms and Training. As a concealed carry instructor, I see people every week out on the range with guns they can't shoot properly because they didn't know what to buy. That will never happen at Elite Firearms and Training. Larry Jackson will personally fit you with your very own personal defense pistol. So call Larry Jackson today at 616-299-8715 or visit EliteFirearms.us. This is Colonel Danny Gillum. I host Front Lines of Freedom, a weekly syndicated military talk radio show. One of my co-hosts is Skip Coriel, the host of this show. We cover things that impact military and veteran communities, and we do it from the veteran's perspective. The show is broadcast across the nation and is also available as a podcast on our website, FrontlinesOfFreedom.com. Please join Skip and me weekly on Front Lines of Freedom. Okay, folks, welcome back to the Home Defense Show. This is your host, Skip Coriel. Today, we have a special treat all the way from the Great White North, the Upper Peninsula, Bob Peterson from Delta County Gun Owners. Welcome to the Home Defense Show. Well, thank you for having me, Skip. Uh, you know, Bob, that, that sounds so humble and so anticlimactic. I gave you that really big intro, and, and then you just said, well, okay, thanks. That's... <laughs> <laughs> We're going to work on that, okay? Okay. All right. Okay, Bob, where where are you from? Uh, you're up in up in the UP, the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. Uh, whereabouts up there are you? I'm from uh, Escanaba, Michigan. Um, we're one of the larger towns in, in the Upper Peninsula, which is one of the smaller towns in the Lower Peninsula. We're kind of centrally located right in the UP on Little Beatty Knock. Ah, well, everyone knows where Escanaba is because uh, that's where our favorite movie was filmed, Escanaba in the Moonlight. Oh, yeah, yeah. That was that was filmed right, right in Delta County here. Um, I, I hope people realize that that was a spoof. <laughs> <laughs> not, not all youpers believe in flying saucers and, uh, you know, the 30-point buck. <laughs> oh, yeah. so, so you, uh, you haven't uh, met the Jimmer then? The Jimmer, no, no. No, the, the guy, I have, he, he I could... haven't had that pleasure. <laughs> okay. What about Jeff Daniels? Did, did you get to meet Jeff Daniels while he was up there? No, I didn't. I'm I'm not antisocial, but when things like that go on, I kind of tend to go to the other side of the county. Ah, okay. All right. I got gotcha. you. Well, I got to tell you, that's one of my favorite movies of all times. Um, you know, we watch that at the Coriel household. We watch that every year. On November fourteenth, right before the opening day of uh, deer season, and we just have uh, a blast with that show. My my three kids especially love that. I have a seven year old daughter, a nine year old son, and a twelve year old son. My wife hates the show. Uh, she's uh, quite a bit more sophisticated uh, than the rest of us are. Uh, I, I think she thinks that I've kind of polluted our children, but uh, you know we just love that show. So, uh, anyways. 
Bob, uh, you are the member at large of Delta County Gun Owners. Uh, first, you know, what is a member at large and, and how big are you? Well, I, I'm actually an officer at large. Oh, okay. Um, All right. I, I was the president uh, since its inception, and a couple of years ago, I felt that there were people that um, could carry the club to or the association to new heights. Mm-hmm. I kind of, you know, went, you get promoted to out of your out of your skill level. Yeah. Um, and I, but I did not want to completely get out, so I moved down to a lower board position. Uh, so that I can keep my hands in it and, and keep working with the club officially. Delta County Gun Owners is about seven years old. We're right around 250 members. Um, we started out with about five or six people sitting at a table at one of the local restaurants uh, complaining about the future of, of gun ownership. And uh, some of us decided to try and do something about it, and so we started up DCGOA, and uh, it has done nothing but grow uh, since its inception. Yeah. Yeah, well, it sounds like uh, your roots were similar to the Second Amendment March. I mean, I started the Second Amendment March, boy, it was back in, uh, oh, 2008, 2009, you know, right about when the Obama became president i think he scared the yeah. scared the snot out of a lot of people it was right about that time frame um so what exactly does delta county gun owners do well we're uh we're kind of a group we kind of uh do a lot of different things our, our main goal is is of course to promote safe gun handling in the second amendment through education and training and work in the legislative end of it. Of course, because we're seven hours from Lansing, are limited in just what we can do directly. Uh, we do come down every year for the Second Amendment March. Uh, we bring five or six or seven people down. And when it's re- when we think that our presence will make a difference, we do come down to legislative sessions and things like that. Uh, a lot of what we do is back other groups that are better suited for handling legislation through donations. We, uh, we raise a quite a bit of money up here and we try, every year we try and do more with that money to either promote training. We've uh, paid to have six of our members trained in pistol and rifle education to teach people how to handle the guns and that we don't do any cpl classes but we get people ready for them so that when they go to the cpl class they have a basic knowledge and the instructors at the cpl classes don't have to take time out to show a person how to load the gun where the safety is how to handle it safely Mm -hmm. yeah we donate like i said we donate a lot of money we try and help out michigan open carry they're very uh, active in legislation, and so we try and help them out as much as we can financially. And as I said, when the need arises where we can make a difference, we will pack up one or more people and drive down to Lansing and, and make an appearance and show numbers. We also try and do, for PR, we try and do uh, some things around the local area, donate to veterans groups, uh, we donate to several youth shooting groups and things like that. Uh, and every year, like I said, as we learn more, because not one of us in our group has ever been in a group like this before. Mm-hmm. So every year we learn a little bit more about how we can be more effective in helping retain our, our gun rights. Right. Okay, now, now Bob... Uh, Upper Peninsula, have you been in the uh, the UP your whole life, or did you move up from under the bridge? I moved up from below the bridge uh, in 1980. Uh, I used to live down in the Saginaw, uh, Frankenmuth area, a um, little town called Vassar, and I graduated from school in 1980 and picked up my all three of my belongings and headed to the UP. Yeah. How in the world... 
do you handle the winters up there? I mean, I'm in southern Michigan. I'm about halfway between Kalamazoo and Grand Rapids. And I got to tell you, you know, I was in the Marine Corps. I don't consider myself a wussy, but maybe I really am because <laughs> I pretty much stay away from the Upper Peninsula, uh, you know, from like uh, October <laughs> through April. <laughs> but, uh, you know, how do you handle the cold uh, winters up there? Well, where I'm at, uh, on the, on the north shore of Lake Michigan, um, we don't really have that terrible of a winter. They, they call us the banana belt because the lake effect, uh, off of Lake Michigan keeps us just a little bit warmer in the wintertime and a little bit cooler in the summertime. Mm. But, uh, nothing that a four wheel drive truck and, and, uh, warm clothes. Yeah can't help you know uh because we have the snow our area has the equipment to deal with the snow so the roads we get a little slippery for a day or two and they're cleaned right up and we go on our way yeah well so what you're telling me is that uh escanaba where you're at in the you know quote unquote banana belt um, that's kind of like the upper peninsula's answer to florida you know people from southern michigan when they go south uh, for the winter, they go to Florida. Uh, people up on Lake Superior, uh, they winter in Escanaba for the warm weather? I don't know if I'd say the people do, but the deer do. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> well, well, that makes it extra nice for you, doesn't it? Um, so you're a uh, deer hunter then? Um, yeah, I'm not, a, I'm not a, much of a deer killer, but I'm a deer hunter. <laughs> You're not much of a deer killer, okay? Well, let me see. I, I have I have more successful seasons where I come home without a deer than I do with. Oh, I see. Well, you know, this year I had the same problem. I mean, last year I got four deer down here. Um, this year I only got two, two plus one roadkill. I, I count roadkill as well. Um, but you know what? I was short on venison this year, but I was very long on stories. So. Uh, you know, and you shoot a deer and, you know, three months it's gone, right? But you get a good story where the one got away. That's the gift that keeps on giving. And you have that for the rest of your life. So I got a lot of good deer stories, uh, this year, but let's talk about your, at your facility. What, what is your facility, uh, like there, Bob? For Delta County gun owners? Yes. Okay. Well, uh, we really don't have a facility, so to speak. We rent a place called the Mead Lodge or the Mead Rod and Gun Club once a month for our meetings. Mm-hmm. And along with that, during our meeting, we get to use their, their range. We are, we are very small. We don't have a lot of overhead. It's, it's really been, I don't know, I guess it's been kind of amazing that in my mind that we've, been able to get along and go as far as we have without really, you know, we really don't offer our, our members anything but the fact they're helping fight for our gun rights. Yeah. So you're, you're small but potent. Uh, you mentioned, uh, Michigan Open Carry before. I guess I would uh, liken you to Michigan Open Carry then because, you know, they're a very small group. I think uh, 500 members or so. But, you know, whenever you hear about, you know, in the news about someone who lobbied or someone who sued, uh, you know, a city or whatever for violating gun rights, it seems like Michigan Open Carry is always to the forefront. So, you know, I certainly got to respect them for that. And uh, Absolutely. Well, and Tom Lambert spoke uh, very well of Delta County gun owners, uh, as did Joel Fulton from Freedom Firearms in Battle Creek. So uh, I definitely I wanted to get you guys on the phone and find out what you were all about. And, you know, I'm the founder of the Second Amendment March, and I always see uh, your banner down there. But I'm just so busy on that particular day with interviews and booze and speaking and all that stuff that I don't get to meet everyone. So I'm, I'm really glad uh, that I got to meet you uh, today, Bob. Now, um, well, I, I was glad to talk to you, too. All right. Well, Bob, you know, uh, we're about out of time for this segment, but 
Uh, when we come back, I'd, I'd like to talk some more about uh, the UP. I'd like to talk about uh, some of the legislation uh, that that's coming up, and and what your take on uh, take on it is, and maybe uh, are there any differences between uh, the Upper Peninsula and the Lower Peninsula as far as gun owners are people in general. So, uh, if you can can you stick around for another uh, 13, 14 minutes? You bet I can. All right. Okay, folks. This is Skip Coriel on the Home Defense Show. While we are away, we got a two-minute break here. Go ahead and check out our sponsors, firearmslegal.com slash Midwest Tactical, and see what they can do for you to help protect you and your family should you ever have to use your firearm uh, for self-defense. And then go to EliteFirearms.us and see what Larry Jackson can do to help you choose the personal defense firearm that fits you perfectly. This is Skip Coriel on the Home Defense Show. Don't go anywhere. We will be right back. Corey out on the Home Defense Show. Always use guns safely and wisely. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Hey, folks. I want to tell you about my book, Civilian Combat, the Concealed Carry Book. More and more people across the country are seeing the dangers in society and are deciding to carry concealed to protect themselves and their families. My new book lays it out step by step. It'll teach you how to protect and defend the ones you love. Get the benefit of 17 years of teaching experience and a lifetime of training for this important role in society and in your family. You can get Civilian Combat real easy. Just go to Amazon.com, search on Skip Coriel Civilian Combat, and it'll pop right up there. Don't put it off any longer. Get Civilian Combat, the concealed carry book by yours truly, Skip Coriel. Wouldn't it be wonderful if life was like the movies and the good guys always won? In today's world, if you're forced to use your firearm to protect yourself, you will need protection. Firearms Legal Protection is here for you. FLP provides you with seasoned, experienced attorneys that handle your criminal and civil matters as a result of you protecting yourself. FirearmsLegal.com provides its members with uncapped attorney's fees, bail bond protection, and coverage in all 50 states. We are not a reimbursement plan. You can access uncapped attorney's fees for as low as $10 a month. Firearms Legal members are provided with educational services, training videos, and access to our vast national attorney network. While you're protecting yourself, let Firearms Legal protect you. Listen up, folks. This is important. There are plenty of legal protection services out there, but none will protect you as well as Firearms Legal Protection. This is the one I use and the only one I recommend. Visit FirearmsLegal.com slash Midwest Tactical and protect your family now. Okay, folks, welcome back to the Home Defense Show. This is your host, Skip Coriel. We are speaking with Bob Peterson, the officer at large for Delta County gun owners in Delta County, Upper Peninsula. Now, you know, I used to teach uh, concealed carry classes up there in the Upper Peninsula, you know, the UP, uh, up in Lance, uh, Barriga Way, uh, close to the Keweenaw. Uh, and I would go up there about three times a year to teach and we would have, geez, 20, 30, sometimes 40 students up there. And I got to tell you, Bob, it seems like people in the Upper Peninsula tend to be a little different than people in Southern Michigan. Is it just me or is there a difference? I think there is a difference. I always said when I first moved up here back in 19. 19- I said the UP was about 10 to 20 years behind the Lower Peninsula. Mm-hmm. Uh, at that time, I related that to the music that was playing. <laughs> we were downstate. We were listening to Bob Seger, and up here they were listening to Helen Reddy, you know. Yeah, <laughs> okay. Um, but there are also an attitude and how we look at other people, you know. Downstate, in a lot of the places that I've been, People don't purposely don't go out of their way to interact with other people. Yeah. Where up here, I think it's a little more people go out of their way to interact with other people. Mm-hmm. It's it, it, it is a difference. Um, 
even though there's there's plenty of progressive people up this way, more people tend to be a little more conservative in their way of life and uh, how they get along with other people and that. We're a smaller area and, and fewer people. We've got to more or less be willing to step out of our way to help out mm-hmm. and, and get through the, you know, to get through the day. Yeah. I kind of say that the rest of the nation goes on real highs and real lows uh, as far as the economy and everything else. And we kind of just flutter right along and even keel more or less up here. Yeah. Well, you know, Bob, I think, uh, you know, when I was up there, it kind of felt the atmosphere up there, the ambiance, whatever you want to call it. It felt like lower Michigan uh, when I was a kid in the, uh, you know, 1960s, early 70s, when I was growing up. Boy, it just, uh, I mean, things were a lot less populated down here. It was very, very rural. And the people were more down home. They were more uh, uh, congenial, uh, more open to friendships. Then uh, I moved to, you know, the big city, what I would call the big city, Grand Rapids. And it was different because it seems like there's less accountability in the city because you don't know your neighbors. Uh, you can go, you can meet someone and then go the rest of your life without seeing them again. So there's not a lot of accountability up there in the UP. You pretty much, you know, uh, everyone, uh, in your area is, is that right? Yeah, it, it's not quite that way. Uh, but it, it's, it's really, you know, it's, it's a lot closer to what you're saying. Um, I actually lived in uh, Allendale and worked in Grand Rapids for about two years. Mm-hmm. And so I know exactly what you're talking about. And, yeah, up here, even you know, you walk into a bar, and even if you don't know anybody in the bar, in, in five minutes you're going to know somebody in the bar. Yeah, <laughs> right. Uh, you know, it's just that's just the way it's going to be. You're going you're gonna to be fast friends somewhere at some time, no matter what you do. And, you know, downstate, and this is kind of what I was going along saying, is downstate you can walk into a bar and not have anybody even look at you if you're not a regular in that bar. Yeah. Uh, Bob, when you're uh, when you're driving down the road, you know, back in the 60s, 70s, uh, my dad always stopped to help someone. Um, down here now, people don't stop. Uh, they're afraid. Uh, I, th- I think there's just a lot more crime than there used to be. It's a multifaceted problem. Up there in the UP, you see someone broken down, do most people stop and help, or do they just drive by? Well, I think in this day and age, because most people have cell phones, mm-hmm. more and more people will say, well, they, they probably already called somebody, and, and they'll keep going. Yeah. But there are there are still times I've done it, and I've seen other people do it, where somebody's sitting on the side of the road, and, and if, if nothing else, somebody will slow down and say, hey, you need me to call somebody for you or something. And that still happens a lot. Yeah. So you actually have cell service up there in the UP? Well, it's intermittent. <laughs> we, we, we even have flush toilets for gosh Oh, sakes. my so, I mean, God. more modern can we get? <laughs> oh, Bob. Oh, Bob. I tell you. You know, I thought you guys were the frontier up there. No. <laughs> no more two-holers, huh? <laughs> no. Well, they're, they're still up here, but, but uh, you know, people, there's a lot of camps in that up here that uh, are, are still pretty remote. Yeah. Um, and there's still a lot of places up here that are remote enough that you don't have cell service. But we're coming along. We're in Another 20 years, we'll get there. All right. You know what? A part of me really wants the Upper Peninsula to stay exactly the way it is right now. I really, really do because, you know, I live down here. I like it down here. I wish it wasn't as populated as it is, but, you know, there's nothing you can do about that. I love visiting the Upper Peninsula, because it just smells different up there. You go out in the woods of the Upper Peninsula, uh, anywhere up north, really, and uh, it, it's more of a primeval smell. You know, you even when you're walking through the woods, I can walk through the, the game area down here in southwest Michigan, 
and the ground is pretty firm. I go up there in the Upper Peninsula, and I'm walking. I mean, the hills are just incredible up there. I'm walking up and down those hills, and it's like you feel like you have a six, eight-inch cushion of uh, dead leaves underneath you. And it's I just get the feeling uh, of history, and uh, I just like it. I like the smells, the sights, the sounds. There's nothing like the Upper Peninsula. Now, am I correct? I thought I saw that you worked in uh, real estate. Is that is that your job? I'm a general contractor, retired, and I do, I do sell real estate now. Okay. I thought I saw that was uh, statewide realty, correct? Yep. I work for statewide real estate out of Escanaba. In my opinion, we're one of the better real estate agencies, of course. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Otherwise, you'd be working but, for uh, somebody else. Absolutely, yeah. Um, the real estate works real good with me because um, I, I'm not much of a order taker, you know. I like to kind of run my own show, and that's the nice thing about real estate is I can set my own hours. If I'm out showing properties on Saturday and Sunday, I can take Tuesday and Wednesday off. Or oh, yeah. If something important comes up, I can work from a computer or a phone and and go do whatever I've got to do. Mm-hmm. Um, are people moving to or away from the uh, the UP right now? Well, we this last year we've had a quite an influx of, of people for uh, quite a while. We didn't have enough properties to satisfy all the buyers we had. Mm-hmm. Um, we do get a lot of people from out of the area that are buying camps and vacant land and, and things like that. We kind of filter them all. Yeah. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you you choose who you want to move to the Upper Peninsula. <laughs> not, not, not really. I'm just, I, I was just teasing on that. But we do attract, for the most part, pretty decent people to come yeah. up here because there's just not everybody wants to be up here like you were talking about. We do have a little harsher winters. Yeah. You can easily be an hour and a half, two hours from the closest big town. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people move here because they want that remoteness. Yeah. If I was 30 years younger, I tell you, you know, more just starting out in life, the Upper Peninsula would be very high on my list. Uh, you know, now 61 years old, I, you know, I get cold. My bones get cold in November, and they don't warm up again till april <laughs> but uh, well i i'm i'm 58 and I'm, I'm starting to feel that a little bit myself yeah um you know I'm, I'm looking at uh you know maybe in in five years or, or 10 years maybe getting my real estate license for arizona and i'll go to arizona and sell real estate in the winter and <laughs> come back here in the summer and sell real estate. you know actually that sounds like a, a pretty good plan uh bob uh you might want to I don't know if you were joking or not, but that sounds like a really good uh, deal to me. You get the best of both worlds that way. Well, that's that's what I'm thinking, you know, and uh, I'm not just joking about it. Yeah, okay. <laughs> it might happen. All right. Well, Bob, let's transition back into uh, guns and uh, gun laws and things like that. Delta County gun owners, what are some of the things that you're concerned about, uh, maybe in light of the, the past election that we just had in november we're really concerned that we've got uh our up our upper tier the governor and the lieutenant governor and and uh, secretary of state yeah yeah ag all all of them yeah Yeah, we're we're really concerned not just that they're not going to be helping us in any way but i i I, we're really concerned that they're going to be uh, against us yeah one of the big things that we're really concerned about up here, uh, or at least I am, and, and we've talked about it a lot with our at our meetings, and that is this red flag law that they're talking about. We're very concerned that that comes in because that's been so abused in a lot of the states that have passed it. Um, well, Bob, Bob, you know, uh, tell us about the red flag law. So my listeners, uh, some of my listeners may not have heard heard about that. Well, basically, what it is is if somebody that you have some kind of a relationship with friend as and and I'm I'm not a hundred percent on exactly the terminology in it, but somebody that you have a relationship with a a, a friend, uh, a spouse, relative, cousin, aunt, uncle, brother, sister can call and say simply say that they are concerned about your 
ownership of guns and your mental capacity or whatever. Mm -hmm. And without due process, without, without a hearing, without the chance to represent yourself, a judge can issue a warrant for law enforcement to come into your house and confiscate your guns. Yeah. In Maryland, they just shot and killed a, an innocent gun owner that had never committed a crime yeah. going in and confiscating his guns. I understand that in Florida, in, is it Dade County, they've gone and confiscated over 800 guns since they passed the law. Oh, wow. Or eight, from 800 different parties, mm -hmm. I, I believe, you know, don't quote me on this, but it, it's a real concern that, that people don't get that, that right to represent themselves before they're stripped of a natural right that is guaranteed by our Bill of Rights. Yeah, yeah th that concerns me as well, because it just seems like a law like that can really, really be abused. And I'm speaking from experience here because I'm on my third marriage, okay? And my first two wives were not the uh, the, the beacons of, uh, of morality and all of that. And uh, they tried to use the system against me, even though I had never done anything wrong. And I can see, yep. you know, something like that being used uh, you know, to like, all right, I've got a grudge against this person or I'll get you kind of a deal because that's what due process is all about, right? It gives you a chance to defend yourself before they actually kick down your door and, and take your guns away. Well, this will, this will be one of the few rights that I know of, maybe the only right that I know of, that you have to petition to, to get them back. It's not, and this is for the whole Second Amendment, for some reason, they feel that you should, that we as American citizens should have to petition for the right to have that. Yeah. Have that right. Yeah, it's kind of backwards. And this is something that I, I talk about a lot when I go and, and speak at different places and that people talk a lot about compromise. You know, they, they want to, they want to compromise and the federal government doesn't compromise. <laughs> you're right. A compromise, you're right. Is, <laughs> a compromise is you have a 78 Chevy pickup that I want to buy, and you want $2,000 for it, and I want to give you 1500 So we compromise and come in at seventeen fifty. Right. The federal government has nothing to compromise with. Their idea of a compromise is we'll let you keep this right, but we're going to take your right. They're both – it's all – everything that the federal government is ours. Yeah. It's not theirs. They don't own it. It's ours. And so it's, it's not a compromise. It's a theft. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of people don't look at it that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you know, Bobby, back, uh, you know, during the Revolution and after the Revolution, even all the way up uh, through the Civil War, people didn't view themselves as citizens of the United States. They viewed themselves as citizens of Michigan or Virginia, the Commonwealth of Virginia. Originally, you know, all these states, these colonies came together and said, we're going to unify. We choose to unify and we're going to give certain powers to the federal government. And since the way they saw it, since we are the ones who are giving you these powers, if we want to take them away, we can take them away again. And uh, over the last 240 years or so, things have gotten backwards. And it's like the, the federal government doesn't serve the states anymore. The states serve the federal government. And that's 180 degrees out of phase. And that's, boy, that really worries me. Absolutely. You know, as you were saying, the states were supposed to be the primary uh, legislative force. And the federal government had very few limited and limited powers. Yeah. Now, through through the use of, of tax money, mostly, they have really overstepped their bounds. And now they now it's like, well, if you do this, we'll give you a little money back, and if you do that, we'll give you a little money back. Yeah. One one of the things I, I've kind of always thought, but you know, that would be a big step, is the state should go back to saying. You know, protect its its citizens and saying you don't have to pay federal income tax anymore, and we'll protect you from that. Yeah, <laughs> and then collect the money at the state level and say to the federal government, "Okay, now we're going to give you a little bit of money, mm -hmm. 
So you can do what you have to do, but we're going to keep our money here in the state so we can run our state the way we want to. Gosh, you know, I love that idea. I think it's uh, much closer to the concept that the founding fathers uh, were talking about, and it certainly would give us a lot more freedom because once a government gets as big as it is right now, right now what do you get? You you get federal gun laws that are hard to fight. I, I mean, we don't want to have to fight a civil war again just to get our rights back again. And, you know, we don't want to beg and grovel, get on our knees and plead to get a portion back of our hard-earned money that we paid out in in taxes. Well, you know, just look at it this way, okay? Delta County gun owners, we'll take them for for an example. A couple times a year, we load five or six people, seven people up and whatever, and we go down to Lansing and we petition for our rights. Now, how difficult is that? That's a seven-hour trip for yeah. us down and a seven-hour trip back. How do we get five or six or seven people and go to Washington? Yeah. And when we go to Lansing, we do make an effect. Yeah. When we go to Washington, we're just like flies on a bull. You know, we're annoying, but we really don't hurt. Yeah, yeah you're right. You're absolutely right. Um, that's why I've always been a, a staunch advocate of local control. I, I like, I mean, the smaller the unit of government, the better. You know, smaller government equals bigger freedom. It's always been uh, my opinion, and it sounds like uh, you're agreeing with me. Pretty much, yeah. I, you know, I, I believe that the powers that were not specifically given to the federal government are reserved to the states, the local communities and then to the individual yeah and uh the like you said the closer you keep that to the individual the better off everybody's going to be absolutely yeah bob you know what i think uh that's a good uh, place to leave it you know you have rekindled my interest in the upper peninsula and you know what i think uh in may i need to go up to the upper peninsula because i am an avid downright fanatical morel mushroom hunter and i know you you've got them up there don't you oh yes we do yeah, but you're not going to tell me where they are <laughs> oh no i'm not all right all right good enough well bob uh i'm definitely going to be heading up there uh is there anything uh that delta county gun owners has coming up soon i know you have your monthly meetings but do you have a banquet or uh anything like that well, in April, the, I believe it's the third weekend in April, we have our annual banquet, and that's the main driving factor for our income. We usually have around 200 people. Last year, we had Tom uh, Lambert come up as a speaker. Mm -hmm. This year, we're actually having Joel Fulton come up as a speaker. Awesome. It's, it's Like I said, that's that's our main income source that we use to help Michigan Open Carry, along with other groups and ourselves, uh, finance what we do. Then in the summer, we usually have at least one open carry picnic. And then we have a lot of other small events that go on, but most of those are, are just getting out and reaching people. They're not, uh, income makers. Sure. So, you know, this last year we had a combination open carry picnic in September with, uh, Michigan Open Carry and Delta County gun owners. We had, I think, 13 or 14 people come up from Michigan Open Carry to our picnic, and it was a big success. We had like 100 people, around 100, 150 people show up throughout the day. So we, we do have a lot of stuff going on, and if anybody's interested, uh, you can look up our Facebook page, which is uh, Delta County Gun Owners on Facebook, or you can go to our website, which is deltacountygunowners.net, I believe. All right. That sounds fantastic. Well, you know what? Uh, since Joel Fulton, uh, he's only like 40 minutes from me. Since he's going up there to speak, I think I just might uh, grab a ride with Joel, head on up there and get some good Upper Peninsula food. And it might be a little early for mushroom hunting up there, but yeah, I may give it a try anyways. But, hey, I want to stay in touch with you guys, Bob, because you guys are serious about, uh, about uh, guns and personal offense and about freedom in general. So... Uh, Bob, I just want to thank you very much for being on the Home Defense Show today. It was totally my pleasure, and anytime you want to come up, get a hold of me, 
We'll go do just some discovery. All right. Sounds good, Bob. Okay, again, you can go on Facebook, go to Delta County Gun Owners. You can find out all about them. Um, we're going to take a two-minute break here while we are away. Uh, check out Delta County Gun Owners and then also our sponsors, firearmslegal.com slash Midwest Tactical and then elitefirearms.us. When we come back in segment four, we'll be uh, giving you the wrap-up and I'll tell you some really good stories about my time in the Upper Peninsula. This is Skip Coriel on the Home Defense Show. Don't go anywhere. We will be right back. Welcome to my dad's Home Defense Radio Show. You're going to love it. Hey folks, I want to tell you about my book, Civilian Combat, the Concealed Carry Book. More and more people across the country are seeing the dangers in society and are deciding to carry concealed to protect themselves and their families. My new book lays it out step by step. It'll teach you how to protect and defend the ones you love. Get the benefit of 17 years of teaching experience and a lifetime of training for this important role in society and in your family. You can get Civilian Combat real easy. Just go to Amazon.com, search on Skip Coriel, Civilian Combat, and it'll pop right up there. Don't put it off any longer. Get Civilian Combat, the concealed carry book by yours truly, Skip Coriel. This is Colonel Danny Gillum. I host Front Lines of Freedom, a weekly syndicated military talk radio show. One of my co-hosts is Skip Coriel, the host of this show. We cover things that impact military and veteran communities, and we do it from the veteran's perspective. The show is broadcast across the nation and is also available as a podcast on our website, FrontlinesOfFreedom.com. Please join Skip and me weekly on Frontlines of Freedom. This is Skip Coriel from the Home Defense Show, and I want you to have the very best handgun that money can buy. And that's why we recommend you visit Larry Jackson at Elite Firearms and Training. As a concealed carry instructor, I see people every week out on the range with guns they can't shoot properly because they didn't know what to buy. That will never happen at Elite Firearms and Training. Larry Jackson will personally fit you with your very own personal defense pistol. So call Larry Jackson today at 616-299-8715 or visit EliteFirearms.us. Skip, it's Armed America time. What do you got? All of us here at Frontlines of Freedom want our listeners to get trained and get armed in that order. We fully support the right to keep and bear arms for all law-abiding families, and we encourage you to find out about the laws governing use of deadly force in your state and follow them to the letter. And of course, don't forget to follow the rules of safety and common sense whenever you're carrying a firearm to protect the ones you love. What's the story this week, Colonel? Well, an armed thief in Florida got a real surprise when his intended target turned the tables on him. The young troublemaker apparently thought that a man in his 60s who was withdrawing cash from an ATM would be an easy prey. The miscreant got a surprise when he found out his would-be victim was carrying. The armed citizen, though held at gunpoint himself, drew his handgun and fired. The suspect died later. Thanks, Colonel. The official acronym for ATM is Automated Teller Machine, but those of us in the self-defense industry know them as Accessory to Mugging. An ATM machine is one of those transitional spaces where you are left open and vulnerable to attack. Think about it. The criminal knows you are going to be either depositing or withdrawing cash while you're there. This is a made-to-order opportunity for muggers. Here are some safety tips you should follow to keep you safe while using ATMs. 1. Whenever possible, use the bank lobby during daytime hours instead of the ATM. It is much safer inside the bank, which will have security cameras, trained employees, and possibly even security guards. 2. Operate at a heightened state of awareness around ATMs. As you pull up, think like a criminal. If you were going to rob someone, where would you hide? Where is the criminal's best ambush point? He will launch his attack from concealment. Look for anything out of the ordinary, and if you see it, just drive right through without stopping. 3. Once you drive up to the ATM, you are in a choke point with walls or curbs on both sides of you. Adjust your mirrors so you can see both sides and the rear of your car. Every few seconds, glance into these mirrors looking for danger. The mirrors are like your surveillance cameras, so use them to their fullest advantage. If there are passengers in the vehicle, have them watch for danger as well. The extra eyes and ears can't hurt. And four, avoid the ATMs at night. But if you have to use them in darkness, there are special precautions you can take. Usually I keep my car in drive with my foot on the brake. 
If you see danger close, then just step on the gas and drive to safety. If the area is dark and you can't see well using your mirrors, then put your car in reverse, again with your foot on the brake. This will activate your rear view camera, which lights up the area behind you, allowing you to see much better. As a general rule, avoid ATMs. Now I know that's not always possible, so when you visit, be ever mindful that you are visiting one of the most dangerous places in our society and exercise extreme caution. Good advice, Skip. Okay, folks, welcome back to the Home Defense Show. This is your host, Skip Coriel. We are having a really good time. I love youpers. I just love youpers. I love the UP. I love writing about it. I love being there. It's just fantastic. So, my hat's off to Delta County gun owners and Bob Peterson. Thank you very much for the job that you do. And I'm looking forward to seeing you folks up in April uh, at your banquet. Uh, I'm going to get to meet you uh, all personally and maybe even find a few morel mushrooms. I would love that. All right. I promised you I'd tell you a couple of UP stories. Youpers. Ah, folks, I've got some very great heartwarming stories about the Upper Peninsula. Sarah and I, you know, we've spent some good time up in the UP. I would teach up there like three, four times a year and just loved it every single time. The people up in the Upper Peninsula, they're a little different. You know, it's like, okay, I'm a troll, so what do I know, right? You know, but they're different than the people below the bridge. The people below the bridge, you know, I'll be teaching a class down here, right? And we'll be talking about legal use of deadly force. When can you use deadly force? Down here, uh, especially with city people, you know, the bigger the city, the more hesitant they are to use deadly force. And they go, oh, I don't know if I don't want to get in trouble. You know, what what will happen if I do that? And I might get arrested. I could go to prison. Maybe I shouldn't carry a gun after all. And it's not like that in the Upper Peninsula. I'm telling you, folks, it's not like that at all. I'm up there teaching, right? I was teaching this one class, and I was trying to explain to people, you know, when you can use deadly force and when you can't. And just in examples, I wanted to make sure they, they got the concept. So I explained it to them, and then I said, well, all right, let's say that you're inside your living room. You know, you're watching television, and uh, you hear a noise outside. And so you you go, you, you get your gun, someone breaks down your door, they rush in with a knife in their hand and they run toward you. And I, I, I point to a guy and he goes, well, I shoot that son of a bitch. And I go, oh, okay, well, yeah, you would be definitely available to use a deadly force uh, in that situation. I said, well, let's switch it up a little bit, make it a little more gray. And uh, I said, all right, you're inside uh, your home. You hear a noise outside. So you get your gun. You open up the door. You walk outside, and there's some guy out in your car, and he's stealing your stereo. And the same guy, with no hesitation whatsoever, said, I shoot this some bitch. And I go, oh, wow, okay. Um, well, that wouldn't quite be right. but uh, And I said, well, let's take it a little step further here. I want to see how far this guy's going to go, right? So I said, all right, you're in your house, you're watching TV, you hear a noise outside, and you walk out there with your gun, and there's someone stealing your chickens. And the guy just automatically says, I'll shoot that son of a bitch. You know, it's like down here we're hesitant. Up there, it doesn't matter what happens. You know, we do not pass go, do not collect $200. You just automatically shoot that guy, right? Now, I can hear Bob Peterson right now. He's shaking his head. He might be chuckling and going, Skip, why'd you say that? You know, we're not like that up here. We're civilized. Yeah, I know. I know you're all civilized. Uh, you know, probably not all of you have had Bigfoot sightings or been abducted by aliens. But some of you have. <laughs> and those are the ones that I love, especially much, much, much more. So, hey. I'm excited to come up there and, uh, and meet you guys. Actually, another story from the UP. 
Sarah and I, we're up there uh, driving, right? Uh, we're, Sarah's pregnant with our first child, Cedar. He's 12 now. You, you've met him. And uh, she's pregnant, and we're driving through, you know, uh, a swamp. There's like, you know, cedar swamps everywhere, right? And we're driving through this swamp, and, you know, we're tossing out names, and she's tossed out a name. I said, no, no, and I tossed out a name. She says, no, no, no. And then we're driving through this cedar swamp. And I, I look outside, I look at all these cedar trees, and I look over at her, and then she looks at me. And at the same time, we said, what about cedar? <laughs> and they go, yeah, 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 cedar. So we named our son Cedar. Uh, the middle name, his middle name is Lance. Cedar Lance Coriel. And then we call him Wooden Stick for short. But, uh, you know, the Upper Peninsula, great place, folks. Um, if you haven't been there, you got to check it out. You really, you might want to wait until April. Uh, you could, some days you can even see snow in April up there. Actually, <laughs> sometimes you can see snow in April down here. But hey, uh, check it out. You're going to love the Upper Peninsula. Go up and see Lake Superior. Oh man, that is a dangerous place. Uh, uh, but I just love watching it cold even in July. Oh, we are out of time. I ran late. I am so sorry, not really, but I had a good time and I hope you did too. I have no idea what we're going to talk about next week, but I'm sure it'll be great. It'll be awesome. And it'll be something that I like. Well, I guess it's time to say goodbye. But before I go, check out amazon.com civilian combat to concealed carry book by Skip Coriel. You're going to love it. Check out the God Virus Adventure Apocalyptic series. You'll love that as well. Check out Delta County Gun Owners. Go on Facebook. Just do a search on Delta County Gun Owners. You will love it. They're great people. Well, okay, folks, that about wraps it up for this week's episode of the Home Defense Show. Until next week, remember your purpose in life is to find something greater than yourself and serve it. Always remember, God, family, country, in that order, it's important how you live, but it's equally important how you die. Your family and the ones you love need your protection, so train, always train, stay alert, stay alive. Until next week on the Home Defense Show, this is your host, Skip Coriel. God bless you, God bless your family, and God bless America. Thank you for joining us this week on The Home Defense Show. Now, get out there and protect the ones you love. We'll see you next week with more of the best in home defense.
Hello, my name is Albert Sodi, and if I got a buck story for you... Bye-bye, boys! Have fun storming the castle!